Hello Norway, I'm here at the Screenplay Film Festival in Shetland and I'm here with Mark Hammond and Linda Ruth Williams. Thank you for joining us. You're welcome. Um, to those of you who don't know, Mark is the film critic for BBC Radio Fiverr and The Observer and Linda is the Professor of Film Studies at the University of Southampton. Uh, now, I, I asked you here to talk about disability and the film industry, both yeah. the portrayal and uh, the industry itself, but I want to just start off by uh, telling us a little bit about the uh, festival and how you came to get involved in Well, we've been doing it for um, nine, nine years. years. We, came, we first came nine years ago when Mark was invited to do a talk about The Wicker Man, mm -hmm. uh, which is one of his specialist subjects. So we came uh -huh. along, and at that point there was only a, there was a book festival, lots of festivals here, music festivals, but there was a book festival called Wordplay, but really active film culture here, film production and um, film appreciation. They wanted to set up a film festival, so they initially got Mark on board as a kind of patron, and then as the years went on and screenplay grew and grew, we became co-curators with Cathy Hubbard. So um, we plan it throughout the year, and. Um, Busk in for the festival itself and have a great time. We've got lots of friends here, and it's a unique place. It's because it's a small community, very cultured, um, lots of interpenetration between music and film culture and literary culture and poetry. And I think that's all reflected in the film culture here. So the festival, as it's grown, has been a mixture of um, homemade stuff, homegrown stuff, homegrown filmmakers who then uh, gone south and come back again or come to present their work and have got budding careers elsewhere. And, and I should say to um, my uh, disabled viewers, it is very accessible and all the screens are accessible and everything has been rather fabulous at the moment, you know, the, you know every, all the facilities and everything is quite accessible. So. Well that is of course I mean, one of the main advantages of having a new bespoke building is that nowadays of course everything is made with accessibility in mind. You don't have to go back very far to realise how much that isn't the case yeah. with, I mean, not, yeah. even, not even very old buildings. And it is terrific. The building that we were in for the first five or six years, the theatre just up the hill, the Garrison Theatre, yeah. Um, yeah, that was an old building that her, was not even built as a theatre. So you'd have been using ramps and just about getting in through the door. But it was very... Um, uh, it was kind of very tunnely, wasn't it? It was, yeah. No, it was, so, it, it, I mean, it, it is... But, that, but that, you know, this is... This is public building, building regulations in the UK, I'm sure it's the same in, yeah. in Norway, that any new building has to have that kind of standard. But, it, but it, it's crucially important because one of the things that we were trying to do with the film festival was to make it inclusive um, in terms of you know showing films to audiences that perhaps wouldn't have seen them before. There was a, a simultaneous translation screening yesterday morning, a German film called uh, Fiddlesticks, which is a terrific piece of work, but there's not a dubbed version of it. They wanted to show it to sort of younger kids. So Cathy Hubbard and two other people did a simultaneous translation, I think it was about 60 or 70 yeah. school kids in there, and they loved it. And the screening yesterday with this simultaneous translation was because it had five-year-old kids who couldn't read that fast. So accessibility is a, you know, quite a wide brief here, taking it to remote communities where there aren't cinemas, and also trying to get all, you know, diverse groups in. And a key part of that is obviously that it now resides in a building which is properly accessible for everybody. And you know, it, you, your festival is not accessible if it is not physically accessible, if it is not set up for all, anybody who is interested to have you know, exactly the same uh, ease of travelling experience. That's, that's you know, one of the great advantages of a new building like this, is it's designed with that in mind. And actually, although I've been over the past few years very critical of a lot of multiplex cinemas, yeah. um, you know, I, I have a real fondness for old cinema traditions, it is absolutely true that newer built cinemas are more accessible and that's crucial in terms of proper film culture that is accessible to everyone who's interested in film. Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> just to say on the subject of Norway, that it's, it's not a given that anything is accessible in Norway. Really? really? It, it, despite, you know, there are new buildings that aren't accessible, even though the law, mm -hmm. the law is quite clear now. But it, it is part of young law in Norway. I think it came out in, like, uh, 2009. So they haven't had much time to, you know, adjust oh. to the regulations. I'm surprised because we always yeah. think of Norway as being fantastically forward-looking and yeah. socially democratic. Yeah, in and a lot of ways it is, but you know, we're still behind on that uh, particular. But on the subject of um, disability, I, um, what do you want, as far as you know, is, is the situation for disabled actors and, and actresses and people working in the industry at the moment? 
I, th I mean, I know no more than anybody else going to the cinema, which is that the situation is starting to change because you're starting to see more and more, in terms of on screen, when you're saying actors, so you're talking about your on screen presences, you're starting to see more and more diverse people on screen now than you would have perhaps before. And I think an obvious example of this, and this is very. In a, in a way, it's almost a too obvious example. But if you look, for example, at the career of somebody like Peter Dinklage, Peter Dinklage is a huge star. You know, he's a, he's a, he has box office clout. If somebody sees him in a movie, they will go and see it. It's amazing how many films now you have Peter Dinklage in because you know he'll bring with him an audience. The interesting thing about his career is it has almost no relation to the fact that he's a, he's a little person it's to do with his size nobody actually nobody thinks that at all they think of him as, as a brilliant actor a versatile actor who can play romantic leads or horrible villains or you know any of those things and he has almost specifically built a career on uh, on being a great actor which has nothing to do with with his size. i remember very early on um he, ha he had starred in a film called The Station Agent, which is a terrific piece of work, which in many ways kind of made, I mean, yeah, we loved that film. It was really, really good. It's a you know, brilliant sort of well-observed, um, slightly satirical, but also kind of wry and melancholic piece. And the writer-director was on the show. And I remember asking, because I, I hate to use the wrong terminology, it really bothers me. And you know, it's a very, it's a difficult area because I had interviewed, for example, a filmmaker who had made a film that he kept referring to as a dwarf love story. Yeah. And most of the people in the film were, were little people. And um, at that point in America, that was the preferred term. There was little people of America or organization. But I didn't know whether that terminology was still in. So I, I said to the director, I said, what what does Peter prefer to be called? And he said, and I, he said he prefers to be called Peter. It's very interesting that his um, debut feature, Living in Oblivion, was that he had a role that specifically commented. Was, yeah, exactly. There's a dream sequence in which he's walking around the, holding an apple, yeah. and he has this whole rant in which he says, "Have you ever actually had a dream in which a dwarf holds an apple?" No. And and it's and it's a wonderful sequence, and that's it's a Tom DeCillo film from I think 10, 15 years ago now. But that sequence stands out because. Because what he's doing is he's he's pastiching an art house trope, which is it's a dream sequence. Therefore, you know, and and you know, it's a, it's a really really great moment, and that's actually one of the very few instances in which his career is specifically referred to his size. I mean, beyond that, he worked because he's a brilliant actor. I mean, and he is a brilliant actor. And the the key to how good he is is that when you think of him, you don't think of heroes or villains. You think of him as a character actor. He has played really scary villains and he has played really likeable sympathetic characters and if you look at the, the funny the strange thing about the portrayal of disability on screen is that some of the places in which the most uh, progressive work is done is in places that you wouldn't immediately notice so for example if you look at the work of the Farrelly's who make particularly kind of you know uh, gross out comedies mm -hmm. and uh, have been criticised over the years for kind of lowest common denominator humor. Some of the Farrelly brothers' uh, uh, movies are like some of them, not so much. But one thing that's very interesting about their work is that throughout their films, they employ people of different abilities on and off screen. And whether or not you think their films are great, they have a real sort of equal opportunities approach to who it is. They're. There was one particular case when they had made a movie called, um, uh, was it Stuck On You Anyway? It was a film in which Matt Damon was a, a Siamese twin. And I remember having a, an interview with Bob Trani. He said, because the interesting thing is, there are people in that film who, who are otherly able that you wouldn't, you don't know. Like there's a guy sitting behind a desk in one of the scenes who doesn't have legs, but we, you don't know. Our principle is they're actors. They're acts like everybody else. And it is funny that that stuff often happens in the places that you don't expect it. Something that happened in Breaking Bad, actually, and I, you know, I'm thinking about this because one of my most brilliant students recently was a wheelchair user, and he did his final year dissertation on disability in film. Um, and his his line was that um, increasingly um, disabled characters are becoming sort of, in a sense, you know, routine cast members, but as a, a sort of sidekick figure or as a best friend figure in the way that black characters might have done and that's part of a, a shift of if you like normalization but he he i remember him talking about the son in breaking bad as a an, you know really interesting figure because he's a disabled actor performing a, a, a character 
who, whose disability is really never mentioned at all. He's simply Walter White Jr. He's the son who's grappling with the whole story of what's happening to his father, and that's really interesting. Um, and he was also um, kind of received in, in press as the hot one, the attractive one in this mm -hmm. show, because he's a you know, young, handsome kid, American actor. But really, his, his disability was made very little mention of at all in the promotion of Breaking Bad and in the narrative as well, and in the way that each series then you know, used him within the family scenario. But I thought that was very interesting. But I'm, I'm really trading off my students' uh, kind of argument about that, but it was very persuasive. And he got, I think he got the highest dissertation mark we've ever given, because it was really a fantastic piece of work. But I would suspect that something of that will continue to happen that um, it, you know, it, it, it might be a while away before, just as with you know, women in particularly mainstream Hollywood or British cinema, which is where we're coming from mostly, you know, are able to carry a movie and um, you know, be the, the sort of name on the marquee. It might be a while away that um, forms of disability are, you know, are forgotten about enough for those actors to be able to lead the movie, but maybe not. Well, I mean, I always remember some years ago, something happened, I went to, uh, I think it must have been Amsterdam, to interview Neil Jimenez about water dance. And, because um, he happened to be there and I was interviewing him for, for a newspaper. And I, was, I was freelancing at the time. And um, anyway, he was, a, he was a really smart guy and I thought Water Dance was a very, very interesting film. I don't know whether you, you're, you're a fan of it, but I, I, I did like it very much. And I went and did this interview with him and he's, he knows his cinema inside out, very cine literate guy. And, uh, you know, very fine, uh, very fine filmmaker. And I wrote the piece up, and because I liked the water dance a lot, and it was it was very had a very kind of progressive attitude towards um, you know interpersonal relations. There was a, there was a lot of reasons to like it, and I remember being absolutely shocked when the newspaper then printed the interview not on the film pages, but on pages that they had put aside for what they were then calling a disability section. I, I remember my blood boiling about this because the whole point about the interview and although the subject matter of water dance is very much to do with you know with, with, with wheelchair users and but that wasn't he was a filmmaker he was that was first and foremost what it was about mm. and I remember being really I mean you remember you know yeah. furious about it at the time then some years later I remember when Murder Ball came out the documentary have you seen that uh, not it's no. wheelchair uh, the best way of describing it is wheelchair basketball and it's like rollerball. I mean, it's called murderball because it's the most aggressive sport you have ever seen in your life. And it is... Um, so it's a Paralympic sport, yeah. It's a Paralympic sport, yeah, but it's a, like, a, I don't know whether it's, it's, it's like a contact sport. In, I mean, it is a fearsome. And um, this documentary, it's, it's actually, I think it's probably called wheelchair baseball, but it's known, in, you know, basketball, pardon me. So much I know about sport, but it's known in the vernacular as murderable because it is like rollerball, and it's the most brilliant documentary, and it's absolutely fantastic. But one of the best things about it is that, obviously, because of its subject matter, it's dealing with you know what's referred to as disability. It's the most fantastically macho, you know, aggressive. It's, it, I mean, honestly, as sports movies go, I've seen documentaries about hiking, I've seen documentaries about skydiving. I've seen there's nothing to compare with the guys tearing around a court and they are really serious they are like really you would not mess with them and it's a brilliant documentary and i remember thinking gosh things have changed even in the time since doing that little man's interview and then that and then that that piece but if you, if you get a chance you should watch it it's riveting it's absolutely terrifying i mean i sport scares me anyway mm. but yeah wheelchair basketball and it's the the, 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 the wheelchairs have got these the sort of flanged out wheels, you know, which is to do with being able to turn. And I mean, it's just, you should see it, it's fantastic. Yeah, we, the, there's an organization in Norway for wheelchair rugby. Which wheelchair is, rugby, right. Oh, well, maybe that's what it meant. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, my, yeah maybe that. It does sound like it. They are quite aggressive. And yeah, I have awesome. seen it in action. It is quite Unbelievable. Massive. So, could I, it's slightly getting away from cinema, but in Norway, was the Paralympics a big deal in terms of mainstream audiences. Yes, I, I think, last time. I think it, it, is, it was a big deal now, this time around. 
Yeah. You know, so in the, form, it's in the same way that uh, you know, women's football is a much bigger deal. Yeah, this okay. Because we, we, we experienced it as so in the UK, but that's because the Olympics was in London. Yeah. And, um, you know, huge audiences for the opening ceremony of the Paralympics, just as there had been for Daniel Boyle's yeah. opening ceremony of the, you know, the, yeah. the, the Olympics Olympics. And then everyone continued to watch it. And I think it's partly because of films like that. But our mainstreamization happened in the 2012 Olympics. And it'll be interesting to see what happens in terms of, you know, the TV coverage and the kinds of audiences that pa the Paralympics get in Brazil. Because yeah. um, it, it was a big shift in perception and in, you know, public excitement, actually. And it's con I think it's really continued. And it does, and actually, funny enough, that does tie into cinema because the, the interesting thing for us about the Olympics. I mean, I have no interest in sport at all, mm. and you're not a huge sporting fan. No. We all watched it. We all watched it because, for a start, with the, the Olympics themselves at the, at the beginning, you know, there was the announcement that Danny Boyle was going to do the opening ceremony. So that's a kind of, you know, it was interesting that they'd gone to a, a filmmaker like Danny Boyle to do that. But then, actually, the buzz and the excitement about the opening of the Paralympics was almost, was it, it, it was, there was, I mean, it would be different in different countries, but certainly in the UK, it was like a coming of age moment. Yeah, when you, it was. You it was. really felt this is a defining moment in shifting uh, perceptions, and uh, and actually, the Paralympics became the thing that everyone was talking about. The yeah. Paralympics became the thing to watch, and I, you know, I was gripped by it. Also, it was film. It was really exciting to watch. But I think for anyone in the UK, that was a that was a watershed moment. Things have changed. The Paralympics are now. They're no longer a sort of secondary offshoot. They are they are every bit as important, if not slightly yeah. more so. Yeah. I mean, everyone was watching them. People who don't care about sports were, were watching the Paralympics. Yeah, there, there was a, I, I sort of overheard a discussion with uh, some disabled actor friends of mine mm -hmm. who said, "Thank God for typecasting." <laughs> and I thought that was kind of controversial because that makes it sound as though the act, the roles that you're given given are sort of defined by your disability. But you know. From their perspective, it was you know it gave them work, and as far as they were concerned, that was you know good enough for reason. So, is that a controversial statement, or is it not necessarily? Well, you know, it, it it speaks to two different concerns, right? The first one is the question of whether uh, an otherly able character should should be played by somebody in a similar situation, or whether. So, I'll give you an example. In that film that I was referring to earlier which was called Tiptoes, which was directed by Matthew Bright, okay? And it had people, I think Peter Dinklage is in that film. Um, but the lead role was a little person who was played by Gary Oldman. I mean, literally in, you know, Gary Oldman on his knees with shoes on his knees, okay? And the film is all over the place. I mean, it's genuinely all over the place. There is some good intent in there somewhere, but it's so far, it, it's just, Gary Oldman came on a radio show I did once and I asked him about it and you've never seen anyone shut down a conversation so far. He said, I've never seen it. I've never, <laughs> I've never seen it. So what was interesting was, okay, why, why would you get Gary Oldman, who is an actor who is six foot tall, to play a character who the defining factor about this character is that they are not six foot tall. They are three and a half foot, four foot, whatever, however tall it was. Because there are other actors in the cast who are the right size and shape, who, are, who will do that role better. They are every bit as good as an actor as Gary Oldman. Why get well? Because Gary Oldman is a star, and there are others. There are other stars. So he felt about that as if he'd sort of mistakenly done a blackface role or something like that, I, I, and then I, regretted it. There was a hint of that. My my feeling was that because he specifically didn't say anything about it. Mm -hmm. I mean, he didn't. There, that film has its defenders, incidentally. Okay. But it, 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 yes, it did seem like yeah. that was the case. I mean, yeah. he certainly made it in a period in his career when he wasn't doing his, his best work. Um, uh, yeah, so that's so perhaps that is exactly what he felt. I should say he didn't ever say that. No, no, that's, no. A, that's a way of reading it. So the question is, firstly, should should those roles ever be played? By anyone other than somebody who is by the absolutely suitable. The other side of that is, should um, otherly able or disabled actors be able to play roles for which they are not obviously physically suited? So should you know should somebody, for example, if somebody in real life um, is is a, uh, is one legged, should they ever play a two legged character, or should they always play the character as one? How much of what you are physically should be embodied by the role now? Things, th th those two things actually cut against each other. My feeling is, if you are going to have, a, a, because there are, 
In the world of acting, there are people of all different abilities, and it seems perverse to me to, to not cast somebody who is clearly you know, prepared for the role already, who would understand the role, who is in the, in the situation of the role. However, the other side of that is, the more we get into a world of CGI, the more we get into a world of virtual uh, acting, the more we get into a world in which a film like Avatar can actually have 90% of what an actor's performance is, or, or Andy Serkis playing King Kong, all those things are falling away. So more and more you can, in theory, put anyone in any role. I absolutely understand the thank God for typecasting because it means that, you know, if, you, if, if there's a role which needs a, a, a wheelchair, well, I'm a wheelchair user, therefore, and in the same way that somebody would no longer use blackface as they had, they had before. That's absolutely true, but the, the, the other side of that is what you don't want to do is restrict the possibility of your roles. Again, you come back to the Peter Dinklage thing about he plays bad guys, he plays good, plays good guys, he plays romantic leads, he plays horrible leads. None of those things are in any way defined or restricted by his size. I mean, I, I don't know that I've ever even heard him talk about it. I mean, I'm sure he has done, but I've read interviews with him and it's never, it's absolutely never been an issue. We should talk incidentally briefly if we have time about silent running, because I think that there's an interesting, do you mind if I? Yeah, go ahead. It's silent, silent for the festival and everything, so. Okay, so Silent Running is showing here at the festival, and it's very much in my mind at the moment because I, I, I wrote a, a short modern classics book about it. And Silent Running is an interesting case because Silent Running is a science fiction movie that nominally stars Bruce Dern on his own in space with these robots, these sort of uh, robots about sort of three foot high. Okay, there's three of them at the beginning, then one of them gets lost. And, of course, he's never on his own because actually he's performing with uh, other actors. Uh, the actors are re referred to often as, uh, uh, as amputees. Actually, there's, there's four different performers. There's only three drones. They were interchangeable. They're all walking on their hands. I think only one of them actually was an amputee. I think the others had been walking on their hands uh, since, since birth. Um, he cast as the drones these people that he referred to as, uh, as, as bilateral amputees. And because what he did was, he thought, I want to make something that looks completely different to what anybody would expect how a robot looks. And he had seen Freaks, the Todd Browning movie, which of course was proved very, very divisive. It was originally banned by the BBFC. They thought it was exploitative, despite the fact that actually its whole thing is that the freaks of the title are not the circus side you. It's, it's, the, it's everyone else. And uh, he had seen in that Johnny Eck, who's this incredibly agile performer, who um, you know, walked on his hands and was acrobatic, was also a brilliant musician, had performed in sideshows with his brother since a very, very early age. It was just an extraordinary thing. And he had seen how agile and beautiful and vibrant he was. And he wanted to build the, the costumes of the drones around that. So he, firstly, they started going to uh, veterans hospitals because in the wake of Vietnam, there were a number of people who had lost limbs as a result of that. And the veterans hospitals worked with them and were very, very good in helping them find the right forms. And there are four you know, great performers working inside those, those drone suits. You don't see their faces, but you see their performances. What's interesting was when that came out, some people kind of flinched. Like, what, what do you mean you're using amputees in this sweet, gentle, like, and I, I remember very clearly Doc Trumbull saying, he was just shocked that anybody should have gone, well, they're actors, they're performers, they're like, and what, what, why is that not, why is that not cute now? A minute ago it was cute, but now it's not. And I think, didn't Spielberg then end up doing a similar... Yeah, Spielberg used in E.T., um, uh, actor, e. The, the character E.T. is, you see, you see the character E.T. as a seamless thing. Sometimes it's a robot something that you'll see that is being worked by cables under the floor. But some of the sequences with E.T. is a person inside and they had a couple of actors. And I mean, I'm just writing a book about um, Spielberg and children. And one of the actors was a 15 year old who walked on his hands. So that's kind of interesting. And I, I'm interested in the, the cast of E.T. and the fact that we talk about, you know, Henry Thomas, who was brilliant as Elliot, and about Drew Barrymore, but very, very few, because Spielberg wanted to keep the mythology that E.T. is a real alien. Mm -hmm. um, there's not a lot that's, that's often said about how E.T. worked. You mentioned earlier um, CGI uh, and how that changes you know, the situation for people wanting to act in films. I, 
it's interesting. Um, for example, for for a film like um, Mad Max Fury Road, which, as well as having having a, a, a character that was seen as sort of a feminist icon yeah. in Broad of Furious, also was seen as a very sort of independent disabled character yes. that you don't really realize that she's disabled for a large part of the film, actually. At least I didn't notice until she took the um, metallic arm off. Well, this, but this, this cuts right into what I was saying before about the, the word, I mean, you, you were talking before about what people, what words people use. And the, the word disabled worries me in that particular context because she's not, she's evidently not disabled not. at all. She has one hand and for most of the movie it's replaced by a robotic hand and then for a lot of it it's taken off. And you're quite right. This whole section, I mean, you never think of Furiosa as being unable to do anything at all. Actually, she's the toughest character in the film. Mm. And, uh, and, it, and you're, you're right, it's, it's some way into it before you realise that she's left her hand on the steering wheel. And I, yeah, I mean, I thought that was a, it was a really interesting choice. I thought that you know that worked very well. But the thing about CGI is obviously in that particular case, what they're doing is they're taking an actor that has two hands and they're giving them the impression of having one hand. I don't. I'm not saying for one minute that what CGI will do is make everybody look the same. What I'm saying is that what CGI can do is make anyone look like anything. Yeah. And so we're all living in a world in which. What film acting is about is changing so rapidly anyway, but the, cost of, but the real change will be when people of all different abilities and all different uh, shapes and sizes will be populating the screens and nobody will think twice about it because cinema will stop pretending that the world looks like one thing.